sure thing. Maybe it is. Eric and Bill. Good morning, Eric and Bill. Howdy, y'all. Ah. Do you hear us? We hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Getting feedback. Oh, there he is. Ah, uh, hello. Yeah, We're going to give people about another minute to get in there, and then we'll start. This is awesome. I don't know. Hold up one second. We're still getting, uh, we're still getting feedback from Yeah, let me try one. I think that's from you, Don. Yeah, I'm one second. I'm gonna... Hello, now. Now it's off. Yeah, because I, I have the phone in the, uh, Audio on the computer at the same time. <laughs> but, yeah, it. Uh, Eric, uh, is anyone else on? Um, well, it shows you're on a couple times. Yeah, Mike's on. Mike and Mary. Good morning. Hey morning. there. Now we've got Schwartz's. <laughs> <laughs> Got two sets of Schwartz's. Yeah. Yay! And we've got uh, so far, and we just added Marsha, just came on. Hey, hey Mark. Mark. Hello. We have uh, we have Tim there too. Yeah, he well, he's in the kitchen, but yeah. All right. Make sure I'm so sure. sad. I want to be there. Well, this <laughs> This is this is going to be, at least for now. This is going to be. Uh, um, I know. Yeah. I'm still sad. I know, I know, but it's good seeing you guys. At least some of you, you get to see. Okay, can, can Bill, you and Eric, Bill and Eric are the only ones who've who've uh, got the courage to come on. Yay! Oh. We're so, on. Like can, you can't see us. Yeah. No, Bill and Eric. Oh, there I can see Don now. Don just came on. Can you see? You can't see me. I can see you. There's Don. There's Don. Okay, so <laughs> what, what do I need to do to be seen? I don't know. Uh, you just gotta click on. Uh, you just gotta um, unclick. Uh, you just have video on. I thought I did that. Okay. All right. Hold up. I can see you. Look. All right. Well, we're we're. We're shy of a we're shy of a minion. Leaving a message. Mute. Start. Okay. Share connect. And we have Cheryl and Mike who are not normally here on a Tuesday morning. They're with us, so that's good. Come on, you blocked my video. What? Mike you cannot, I cannot start video because the host has stopped it. Yeah, because you were just showing a. Uh, oh. You're, you're showing a ceiling. Oh. Okay, that's okay. No one needs to see me. It's fine. I want. Hi, oh, there you go. Can you believe Hi, I, Erica. Can you believe, Hi, Bill. Can you believe I just? Hello. I just turned off my wife. I can actually mute my wife on this. <laughs> well put, Mark. <laughs> How do I do? How do I get this <laughs> wife? Oh. Man. Did you this hear that? This is what we missed. She okay, so I still yeah, I can mute you too. Likewise. Getting a message. So do I have to go back to the app store to get no. on visual? There we yeah. go. Oh, there there we he go. is. There's Mike, Mike and Mary. Mary. I and just Mike. had you on mute. That's fine. 
That's all right. Want to hear you? I, that's okay. <laughs> you you uh you guys are all now. We're, most of us are on video. You don't have to be. Can you you can't, if you're not on video, you yeah. have to hit your number, your your name on the top line, and then go into um the, the four dots and and yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Stop. Okay. So my oh yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, we're missing a few. We're missing, we're missing I know, a few our, Bill. How are you? Our <laughs> Do we want to have crosstalk here? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to know how he's feeling and how he's doing. Yeah, Maybe we're we're all... doing, doing all right. We're doing okay. We're scared. Well, everybody's scared right now. Yeah, everybody. But he's feeling well. That's what I, the surgery went well. Oh yeah, uh, I won't know. Till they take me off the cab of <laughs> Oh, there you go. He's doing, he's doing great. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. It's good to see you guys. Yeah, yeah. Mark. Anytime you need to talk, you talk. No, no, it's a, no. It's a, no, I want we. Thanks for the permission. For Bill. The uh, somebody um, post on Facebook to join us right now to your friends because we're one we're one shy of a minion and we don't have. I was hoping we'd get Rosemary or Judith, one of our normal, our normal readers to to join us. The good thing is. This is the way. Judith's away. I know she's away. Well, she's it's okay. late at night. I think Jared. Uh, it's not. Uh, what are you talking yeah. about? Six o'clock. It's six o'clock. So. Oh, that's true. No, she couldn't. So text Judith and tell her to get on. Yeah, uh, I'm worried about her too. So text your friends. Yeah, we're we're gonna start in a second. And what's great about this is we can also share. We're gonna share. Um, we're going to share the text up there so people will be able to see it and be able to follow along with it. Oh, good. I was wondering how we were doing that. So, oh, look at that. You ever really see that now? Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. So, um, yeah. everybody there? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, <laughs> No, I have a question. Well, we have we have that to share, and we have another thing that if we um, share as well, which is the text of the the Torah text too. So we have that that we might share as well. Um, so let me just see when I get to sharing that. Um, so if we go to, if we share the Torah, I'll go back to the Torah portion that we're reading right now and also share that too. So the wow. good thing is, is that we can um, Isn't that amazing? share those two things too. So you'll have those, um, you'll have those to be able to, to look at. So, um, well, without further, I'll wait for one more minute, wait to nine ten and and then we'll get going. But we, uh, this is, I was hoping we'd get some, like I said, some of our readers and some of the um, more out of town people. I was hoping to get at least one person from out of the country, but um, it's okay. I can send Judith a message, see where she's at. Well, I think, I think Tracy just did. Don't worry about it. Oh, okay. It. Um, I just did. I did. Thanks, Tracy. Jeff will join because uh, he may think it's 9.30. I'm going to call him now. Who else do we know out of the country? Oh, wait, we have somebody coming in right what now. What about Jeff Stein? Jeff Stein. Oh, Stein. oh yeah, the Stein. That's Jeff. Good morning, all. Is that Jeff? I'm here. Yay. There you go. Hey, I was just going to We need to connect at this level um, when we all get back together for those yeah. that aren't here. We can now. So um, we can actually bring this, other than the fact that. We have to, when we're all in the class, um, we'd have to have a video for each one of us. But, um, but we have, you know, we have Erica and Bill, we have Jeff yes. from out of town. So this is pretty cool. Um, this is definitely, um, we now have the possibility of doing this every week. So <clears throat> yay! Um, at least bringing up people um, by video because we, we're not paying for Zoom for um, on a monthly on a monthly basis for the full package. So <clears throat> I think besides Cheryl and Mike, most people have been here for 
um, the last several times or most of the last um, couple years. We've actually been doing this class for four years, almost four years. We've been studying Midrash. We've been studying um, the commentary on the Torah for four years. And we started actually with um, a Torah portion, a story from Exodus, where we were four years ago in the summer. And since then, we've been going through um, all of the biblical Midrash, all the way chronologically through it. And then now we're in... Um, now we're in this um, kind of coming back to Genesis, and we're making our way through, uh, you know, through there. So that's where we are right now. Um, we have we have a um, we have a tradition. Normally, um, you know, the last few months we've been starting with with uh, prayer. We've been studying. We've been starting with a minion. Uh, thanks to the encouragement of Mike Schwartz. And um, today, while we're not going to have a minion, we can start with the, the blessing for studying Torah, which we're doing today. And that is, Baruch HaTadonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kidshanu B'Mitzvotav, it's Ivanu La'asot B'Divrei Torah. We thank you, God, for the mitzvah of studying Torah. So phone and number wouldn't help? Studying Torah together. What? What was that? Mike is on the phone with his doctor, sorry. Okay, no problem. That's important, too. So I do want to say that it, to keep us fresh and to keep us alive during this time when we're definitely not in our normal state, it, this class is really important because it's going to continue to, you know, a lot of our gyms are closed, a lot of the normal stuff that we do uh, physically, we need to keep active, we need to keep our minds active, and uh, obviously this is going to keep us spiritually active today. So I encourage everybody to do these kind of things, to, to be men, at least mentally active, to um, to to be reading to and to be doing as much as you can and so this is really cool to, to set aside a fixed time for torah study which is what we're doing right now so a fixed time for for study a fixed time for, for prayer if we don't set aside time for that we end up not, six, six, one. same as same as a gym so um so i will tell you it's important uh again to have these appointments to have these uh daily routines to um to get dressed not to sit around in pajamas all day. I will tell you, was there was a question of whether yes. I actually am wearing pants right now. I want to preach. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I wasn't like wasn't wearing anything, but I had <laughs> I was actually wearing pants, but um, dress pants. So the, <laughs> we're gonna start. Um, and again, for people who, who haven't been here before, or this is our first time. You don't have to be here every week. You don't have to. Uh, you can come and and um, and go and you know and and do what you got to do. But um, I want you to know that uh, you know I always try to let people know where where we were, what we you know what we were doing uh, the last week. So the last week we actually read about the death of Abraham um, and the last moments of of Abraham. Now we're going to be getting into. Um, Almost immediately, we're gonna you're gonna see we're gonna get into the life of, of um of his of his grandsons of, of Jacob and Esau, which means we kind of skip right over Isaac, and that is something that we um. We've talked about, uh, several times that there's not a lot of, of text about Isaac. There's not a lot of text about him in the Bible, and there's not a lot of text about him in the Midrash, um, and so he's really a, a big question mark for us, but. Um, let's take a look at why, and uh, as I said, we'll we'll look at the we'll look at the um, we'll look at um, the uh, midrash, but also maybe occasionally go back and look at the biblical text. So everybody sees the uh, the text. We're starting with the the patron of of Hebron. Everybody see that? Yeah. Yep. Over there. Yes. So we're going to start there, and um, and. Um, Technology is amazing. And let's see. Um, well, does somebody want to volunteer reading? I can read. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just let me know if it's coming through. But okay. Once upon a time, some Jews lived in Hebron, few in number, but pious and good, and particularly hospitable. When strangers came to the cave of Mach 
Elah to pray there, the inhabitants of the place fairly quarreled with each other for the privilege of entertaining the guests. And the one who carried off the victory rejoiced as though he had found great spoil. So what this uh, Midrash is about is about the cave of Machpelah after Abraham dies. So these are, these are going to be fairly late commentaries, this section right here. The rest of what we're going to be reading today is going to be about, the, the, about Jacob and Esau. Um, but there is this interesting set of Midrashim about what happens at the cave of Machpelah, which is, as we know, currently under Israeli control for the last uh, 50 years or so. It's been under Israeli control. It, it, it's uh, an area that's completely, the Jews who live there are completely surrounded by Palestinians, but they maintain the site of, of Abraham and the patriarchs and matriarchs burial place, continue to pray there. And as we're going to see from this Midrash, this issue of protecting and tending to this pilgrimage site was a very important, very important for us for, for thousands of years. So you're going to see this, just some interesting Midrashim about, about uh, the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. And, um, and again, it's kind of not what the rest of today is going to be about, but it is, um, but it is, um, it is going to be, it's just a fairly late Midrash. So here we go. At the end of the fast. Oh, sorry. I went a little too far. On the eve, yeah. On the eve of the Day of Atonement. Don? You might have lost Don. I don't see him. I forgot on me. I'm good. On the eve of the Day of Atonement, it appeared that in spite of all their efforts, the dwellers of Hebron could not secure the tenth man needed for public divine service. And they fear they would have none on the holy day. To an evening when the sun was about to sink, they described an old man with silver white beard, bearing a sack upon his shoulder, and his raiment tattered, and his feet badly swollen from much walking. They ran to meet him, took him to one of the houses, gave him food and drink, and after supplying him with new white garments, they all together went to the synagogue for worship. Asked what his name was, the stranger replied, Abraham. Yeah, hijacked, but good. Yeah, yes. pretty, pretty well, right? Yeah. Let's keep, let's keep going with the story. Yeah. At the end of the fast, the residents of Hebron cast lots for the privilege of entertaining the guest. Fortune favored the beetle, who, with the envy of the rest, bore his guest away to his house. On the way, he suddenly disappeared, and the beetle could not find him anywhere. In vain, all the Jews of the place went on a quest for him. Their sleepless night, spent in searching, had no result. The stranger could not be found, but no sooner had the beetle lay down toward morning, weary and anxious to snatch some sleep, that he saw the lost guest before him, his face luminous as lightning and his garments magnificent and studded with gems radiant as the sun. Before the beetle, stunned by fright, could open his mouth, the stranger spake and said, I am Abraham the Hebrew, your ancestor who rests here in the cave of Machpelah. When I saw how grieved you were at not having the number of men prescribed for a public service, I came forth to you. Have no fear, rejoice, and be merry of heart. So that's that's a story of Abraham's ghost joining a minion um, in Hebron. Now, obviously, that tells us that there were times when there were not many Jews that were living in Hebron, but it does tell us that there was Jewish there was a Jewish population there when this was written. We don't know exactly when this was written. And again, the word beetle is a another word for the shamus, the the helper, the guy who helps run the synagogue. Um, and those were pretty important roles um, back in the day. Mm -hmm. And so he's the guy who's tending to the synagogue, making sure it's functioning uh, and maybe the executive director slash janitor. Um, and so again, um, Abraham does this mitzvah. It's kind of a, an interesting ghost story, if you will, but it's, it is one that um, shows us that Abraham 
is uh, aware of what's going on in this world. So that's one story. There's another story. There's going to be two more of Abraham um, visiting people in Hebron. Here's the other one. Another one. Okay. On another occasion, Abraham granted his assistance to the people of Hebron. The Lord of the city was a helpless man who a heartless man who oppressed the Jews sorely. One day he commanded them to pay a large sum of money into his coffers, the whole sum in uniform coins, all stamped with the same year. It was but a pretext to kill the Jews. He knew that his demand was impossible of fulfillment. The Jews proclaimed the fast and day of public prayer on which to supplicate God that he turn aside the sword suspended above him. The night following, the beetle in a dream saw an awe-inspiring old man who addressed him in the following words. Ha! Ah, quickly, hasten to the gate of the court. Where lies the money you need? I am your father, Abraham. I have beheld the affliction wherewith the Gentiles oppress you, but God has heard your groans. In great terror, the beetle arose, but he saw no one. Yet he went to the spot designated by the vision, and he found the money, and he took it to the congregation, telling his dream at the same time. Amazed, they counted the gold, precisely the amount required of them by the prince, no more and no less. They surrendered the sum to him, and he who had considered compliance with his demand impossible recognized now that God is in with the Jews, and therefore they found favor in his eyes. Yeah. So that, that's a, another, I thought there was one more too. There's another one, there's another similar midrash of um, Jews being able to do miracles and help um, help a vizier find money or find a treasure through the intercession of Abraham. So mm -hmm. those midrashim are probably from the late Middle Ages by a time when Hebron was under Arab control. Um, it doesn't say so specifically there, but um, it seems like that, that's a fairly... A fairly late um, midrash, and um, reflects a time when when Israel was under control of Christians, but actually under control of Muslims who also venerated uh, Abraham's tomb. So those those are not really what we're studying, but it was there, and we I didn't want to leave it alone. But now we're going to really get into um, the main part of the text today, which is the story of Jacob and Esau, and the fact that this is, um, uh, a lot of this you may have remembered or may have heard that the Midrashim on this, because they're so, they're really so powerful. They're, um, they are uh, part of a very, um, a very descriptive and very elaborate story of, of the Jake, of Jacob and his brothers, of his brother and then his sons, um, a very, very big part of the book of Genesis. Uh, we've mentioned this before. It's basically the last half of Genesis is all Jacob um, and, and his family, all the way through Joseph. So from chapter 26 here, all the way to chapter 50, it's very simple. I mean, you can do the math pretty simple. That's Jacob and his family. So if the first 25 chapters are the creation of the world all the way to the death of Abraham, um, and I will illustrate that now by sharing um, this text, which is the uh, Torah text in Hebrew and English. Uh, you can see that um, chapter 25 ends with the death of Abraham and uh, his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah. And then it gives us the line of Abraham's son, Ishmael, the sons of Ishmael. And then we, immediately we go into the story of Isaac, Eli toldot Yitzchak, ben Avraham, Avraham holidet Yitzchak, which reminds us again that Isaac is indeed the son of Abraham. It repeats it so that we never question Isaac's paternity. But it says, this is the story of Isaac, Eli toldot. It also can be translated as, this is the, these are the generations of Isaac. It says, Isaac was 40 years old when he took to wife Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, the sister of Laban, the Aramean. 
And then the next line is, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord responded to his plea, and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. But the children struggled in her womb, and she said, if so, why do I exist? She went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord answered her, two nations are in your womb. Two separate peoples shall issue from your body. The people shall be mightier than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first one emerged red like a hairy mantle all over, so they named him Asa. Uh-huh. Guess what? In case you missed it, that is the story of Isaac. That's it. That is it. It is nothing else other than he gets married, or he, ha- he has he's the son of Abraham, and then he is the wife, he has his wife, and then he has kids. There is nothing about Isaac really as a person. There's there's another chapter coming up which has a little bit about him, but as you can see, there's not really a lot about Isaac as a person. And that isn't helped exactly by um by what we get in the Midrash. The Midrash doesn't have a lot even to base the story of of um of uh Isaac on and uh, you know have material to even launch off of. So that's why when we get into um to this you can see we go right from the death of, of Abraham into the birth of Esau and Jacob. So um, let's continue and we'll do the story of Isaac. And you can see now why we have this first paragraph. Here's the midrash on the fact that Isaac is indeed the son of Abraham uh, and almost an almost exact copy of his father so that no one should ever judge or, or uh, not believe that a hundred-year-old man can have a child. So here's what it says. Don? Isaac was the Isaac. counterpart of his father in body and soul. He resembled him in every particular, in beauty, wisdom, strength, wealth, and noble deeds. It was, therefore, as great an honor for Isaac to be called the son of his father is for Abraham to be called the father of his son. And though Abraham was the progenitor of 30 nations, he is always designated as the father of Isaac. So, uh, Abraham is, uh, Abraham's greatness is reflected in his son. But notice that the, the Bible tells us that he has other children, including Ishmael and other nations come from him, the Midianites. But it tells us that because he's the father of Isaac, he's our ancestor. He's the ancestor of, he's the ancestor of the Jewish people through Isaac. So that's what one of the other things that we have with Isaac being mentioned. Um, but again, not a lot of information other than Isaac is a is a is another link, an important link in the chain. So here we go with Isaac and his wife. This is a little bit, we read about Rebecca a little bit, how we found her or how Eliezer found her, how we discovered her in Aram in Syria. But this is now a little bit more about her and why she was such a wonderful, amazing woman. Despite his many excellent qualities, Isaac married late in life. Now God permitted him to meet his, the wife suitable to him only after he had successfully disproved the mocking charges of Ishmael, who was in the habit of taunting him with having been circumcised at the early age of eight days, while Ishmael had submitted himself voluntarily to the operation when he was 13 years old. Sounds like a hazing routine. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, for this reason, God uh, demanded Isaac as a sacrifice when he had attained to full manhood. At the age of 37, and Isaac was ready to give up his life. Uh, Ishmael's jibes were thus robbed of their sting, and Isaac was permitted to marry. But another delay occurred before his marriage could take place. Directly after the sacrifice on Mount Moriah, his mother died, and he mourned her for three years. Finally, he married Rebecca, who was then a maiden of 14. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, first of all, this Midrash takes into consideration this idea that Isaac was 37 when the sacrifice, um, when Mount Moriah happened. 
um, it is, uh, there's no reason to, um, to believe that that is um, the only explanation, but the Midrash follows that understanding that he was in his 30s when he was almost sacrificed. And what's interesting about this is that it gives us another reason for the, the, the sacrifice, and that is that Isaac had to prove himself uh, uh, essentially against Ishmael, against his, against his half-brother. That Because Ishmael said, look, I was willing to get circumcised at 13. You never, you never even had to make a decision when you were circumcised that essentially the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, is the ultimate test in saying, well, really? You did that at 13. You could make an argument you're still even a minor at that point. Or, or not definitely a developed a man, but at 37, I was willing to give up my life. It doesn't really explain why he had to wait till 37, uh, not 20 or 25, but the interesting fact that, um, again, if you do the math, if Isaac also goes to the Akedah and that's what causes his mother to die, that would mean that she was um, um, 127, as it says that she is in the next uh the next chapter of the Torah, it says in chapter 22, that she dies at 127. So that's why we know Isaac's not older than, than 37 when he goes to the Akedah, but he could have been younger. But the, uh, the Midrash and the, uh, the tradition that he was 37 when that took place is one that, that this Midrash takes into consideration. And then it also then backs up to the fact that the Torah says that he's 40 years old, as we read, when he is married. So if he's 40 years old um, when he gets married, then three years took place between the Akedah, his mother dying, and his marriage, which means that he mourned his mother for three years, which is a really long time uh, to be mourning. It also means that he got, as we know, the Torah says he was 40 years old when he got married. He, he's, he's, that's not normal. And the, and, the, and the Midrash is telling us that that's not normal. It's not the way things are supposed to be. People aren't supposed to get married at 40. And why is this guy who has, as the Midrash says, excellent qualities, why is he getting married so late in life? So, um, again, part of it is that he has to prove himself. But this other issue um, does not sit well with us, which is, is that he seems to have waited a really, really long time to get married. And it doesn't seem to be there doesn't seem to be a reason for it. There doesn't, that, I mean, the Bible doesn't give us a reason for it. And so the Midrash really is, is trying to figure out why is it that he, after being a good guy, after, you know, seemingly having all the good qualities of his father, there isn't anything negative about him. Why, why is he, why does he, um, why is he coming in so late? So uh, into, you know, manhood and doing what he's supposed to be doing. Mark, can I ask a question? Yeah. So Isaac, um, he's the one that they were going to sacrifice when he was a little kid, right? This is the right yeah. Isaac. Well, we don't, we, yeah, but we don't know that he was a little kid. The Midrash, as, we, as we've said, uh, as we read this a few weeks ago, um, the actual Akedah, the actual binding story, is, is he might have been an adult when, it, when he went through it. You know, we, we usually think he's a, a younger kid, but the, yeah. the Midrash yeah. doesn't actually say that. But he does not have much of a relationship with, um, with Abraham, right? Over Correct. those years. But yet they're saying he so mirrors his father in every way. So that will also include the leadership? Yeah, but interestingly, the Midrash, the Midrash doesn't have a lot of conversations between the two of them. Um, the Torah, as we said, has no conversations between the two of them. For the Akedah. There is no conversation in the Bible. There is no dialogue between Abraham and Isaac after that. So everything that he does, meaning Isaac, is in an, it's inherent. It's just an, it's inherent to him, right? The behaviors, the yeah, that, that's definitely what the rabbis feel. Um, but interesting. There's there's other ways you could go with it. The issue is is that we know from from um, the Torah is that he, as we're about to read is that Rebecca and Isaac don't have a child until he's 60. 
Now we don't know how old Rebecca is. Rebecca. They, just told us, they just told us that Rebecca was 14 when they got married and he's 40 and he's, and she's 14. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's not exactly, wow. not exactly what we'd like to hear, but um, there's a few reasons for Rebecca only being 14. One of them, as we've all, we kind of discussed before is that getting her away from her father and brother as, and again, we're about to see it in this, in this paragraph was really important and to get her away from her father and brother her father Bethuel and her brother Laban as soon as possible is really, really, really important. So the sooner we get her away from those people, the better. On the other hand, uh, they don't want her to be so young that it's, you know, that it's really problematic. Um, but there is, um, there is this tradition that um, Rebecca, when she finally has children, you know, she would, that would put her in her 30s, mid 30s, which is late, but it's not, you know, in her 90s like Sarah. But there are re repeated traditions, namely that the men and women, the patriarchs and matriarchs have a hard time conceiving that this is not, this is not following a normal, um, that what would be a normal trajectory of people starting a family. So the Bible gives us that. The Midrash has a problem with it in the sense that these people are all righteous people. So why are they essentially being punished with, with this situation? And they're not, they're not going to say, well, it's because they made a mistake or it's because they did something wrong. It's going to, it's going to give reasons for it. So again, in Isaac's case, so that he could um, prove to Ishmael that he's, he's even more righteous than him. I mean, you have to really stretch this to find these. You know, the, the, the bigger lesson maybe is that, is that righteous people don't necessarily have it easy when it comes to starting a family. Um, the rabbis don't want to say that, it's, that, it's, that, there's, um, that there's anything other than God's purpose here, but it's, it's, it's a tough one. And, and that's the way they go. That's the way the, the Midrash goes as far as saying there must be a reason for this. So uh, that's why it says, despite his many excellent qualities, Isaac married later in life. Um, and again, partly it's because we had to find uh, Rebecca. We had to get Rebecca. So let's read about a little bit more about Rebecca. Rebecca. Rebecca was a rose between thorns. Her father was the Aramean um, uh, Bethuel, and her brother was Laban, but she did not walk in their ways. Her piety was equal to Isaac's. Nevertheless, their marriage was not entirely happy, for they lived together no less than 20 years without begetting children. Wow. Rebecca besought her husband to entreat God for the gift of children, as his father Abraham had done. At first, Isaac would not do her bidding. God had promised Abraham a numerous progeny, and he thought their childless was probably Rebecca's fault. Well, and it was her duty to supplicate God and not his. But Rebecca would not desist, and husband and wife revered to Mount Moriah together to pray to God there. Hold, hold it right there. Yeah. So let's, let's just take in what we saw there for a second. Um, um, so I... I mean, what you just read is, is that the fact that they weren't having children caused friction in their relationship. And that's what it says. Um, 20 years and they weren't having children. And, and, and the Midrash tells us that Isaac, Isaac thinks that it's her fault, not his fault, that it's her fault. Uh, the first family council. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and and so um, so Isaac Isaac's not really sure what to do and or, or we can say that part of what he is sure is that it's not his problem it, he's not the one who has to pray and so when Rebecca says to her husband go and pray which is what the Torah you know, what the Torah says, and again, to, to, 
to show you again what the what the Torah has to say about that. Again, it says specifically that one word. Um, it says that Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. So, so it seems as though there's a reason why Isaac pleads and not his wife. I didn't know Isaac and uh, Jacob were twins. No, um, Isaac, no, no, Jacob and Esau. Uh, yeah, Isaac Jacob and Esau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I knew they were close. I had no idea. Oh yeah, no. This is a, this is real important, and you'll see in the midrash today. The fact that they're actually twins is super, super important. And of course, they get the issue of, I mean, can you imagine if you're born a second before your brother that you inherit twice as much as he does? It's bad enough that they could be, you know, he could be born a year or two uh, before you, but literally a second before you and winds up with twice as much as you just because he happens to be the one who gets out first. So that's that's an interesting. That's an interesting thing to think about here too uh, when we get to it. But right now, again, on this issue of, of why is Isaac pleading for the Lord, you could say, well, Isaac, you know, Isaac wanted to plead because he wanted to have kids. But it doesn't say that Isaac ple was pleading with the Lord on his behalf. It says specifically, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife. Listen. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so when you have this, when you have this there, when you have this line there, Isaac pleaded on behalf of his Lord. And so the question is, is why isn't number one, why isn't Isaac pleading on his own behalf? And number two, why isn't Rebecca or why isn't Rebecca pleading on his behalf? I mean, on her behalf, why isn't she praying? So there's no two issues are there just in that one paragraph. Okay, I want that one line. Sorry, not that one paragraph, that one line, that half a line. Now, if you say that it's because Rebecca, you know, doesn't want to talk to God, that's not true based on the next line. Because it says the Lord, the children struggled in her womb, and she said, If so, why do I exist? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord answered her. So, number one, we know that. God does talk to her, that God, and, and also more importantly, that God speaks to women, that God answers and speaks to women. Now, we know that from the very beginning. God speaks to Eve in the Garden of Eden, but that, that women also can talk to God and get prophecy, if you will, because this is a prophecy. The, the, the rabbis will point out that this is, this is an example of a woman getting a prophecy, of learning what's going to happen in the future, not just talking to God about the here and now, but, but getting something about the future. So, so again, it's, it's that she can talk to God. She does in fact, talk to God. And, um, and so remember that, that uh, she can talk to God. She does. She will talk. And she does in fact, talk to God and that Isaac doesn't, doesn't say, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, um, on my, on my behalf. So let's read what Isaac actually says. Where are you? I can hear you. Isaac. Isaac said, and Isaac said, that's where we are. You know, when you go to all these, check and see. Uh, there I am. And Isaac said, the Lord of God of heaven and earth, whose goodness and mercy fill the earth. You who did take my father from his father's house and from his birthright and did bring him unto this land and did say unto him, to you and thy seed will I give the land and did promise him and declare unto him, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea. Now my, may my words be verified, which you did speak unto my father. For you are the Lord our God, our eyes are towards you, to give us seed of men, as you did promise us. For you are the Lord our God, and our eyes upon you. Isaac prayed there furthermore that all children destined for him might be born unto him from this pious wife of his, 
And Rebecca made the same petition regarding the husband Isaac. Yeah. Okay. We're good. Uh, okay. Um, the united prayer was heard, yet it was chiefly for the sake of Isaac that God gave them children. And it is true. Rebecca's piety equaled her husband, but the prayer of a pious man who is the son of a pious man is far more efficacious than the prayer of who, though pious himself. Scroll down. Oh, yeah. Um, is descended from a godless father. So let's, let's pause right there. Yeah. Excuse me, Mark. Yeah. Mark, can you mute um, Marsha? Yeah. Can yeah, it is. Oh, is well, it? I don't think so. It was. Hold on a second. Let me see the. It is now. It, okay. All right. Yeah. So I thought it, I, I did, and then it must have gone off. So, um, so you can see that um, you can see what Isaac's prayer is. Um, mm -hmm. He not only prays for children, but he prays for children through his wife Rebecca. And so that's maybe something that even Abraham didn't do in the sense that um, we don't really know what Abraham does when he's not having children, but we, we know that Rebecca, we know that Rebecca is the, the only wife he has, unlike his father who ends up having the first child through Hagar. So, so he actually specifically says, I want this woman to have the baby, not that I want to have a baby, but I want to have this woman. And of course she says the same thing. Now, Again, the rabbis are turning back to this issue of why does God listen to Isaac's prayer? Why doesn't Rebecca pray? Didn't was there really a need for Rebecca to pray in addition to uh, to Isaac? Um, and on one hand, they say it took both of their prayers, the united prayer. Um, but then there also is this uh, there is this issue of. is her prayer really equal to Isaac's? And so we have a midrash and probably a different midrash that no, it, it, we, we needed both, but his was a little bit more important. His was a little bit more powerful. And the reason was, is because his father is Abraham, whereas Rebecca's father is Bethuel. So it does make a difference, your, your, your lineage. It makes a difference where you came from. Now that's an interesting, that's an interesting take on it. You could maybe say they would go the uh, the other direction that somebody who who wouldn't have had a good upbringing that their prayer would have been even better because they didn't have really a good role model. But um, the rabbis seem to be saying that you get extra power from those who came before you, uh, and you do, and you do. Uh, that you do, um, there is extra power to that. There is extra power to the to your to your genial, you know, in your genealogy for your for your prayer. It's an interesting idea, and it's one obviously that, um, you know, if you're if you're, I wouldn't say necessarily obsessed, but if you definitely are concerned with your genealogy, which the rabbis were, um, this is an example of of why, and it's because whether we like it or not, our, our prayers would have more power if, um, if we had that, that genealogy. So it's an interesting midrash. Um, and, uh, and again, you could take away from it what you'd like, but I, I, I definitely take away from the fact that they both, they, they both prayed and their united prayer was what, was what did the, the job. So one of them by themselves wouldn't have done it, but together they were able to pray. Now, we're going to read a ne a, this next Midrash right here, which seems to go against some of what we've read before. So let's take a look at this. Yeah, it's just common on, I mean, in the, the part before, I mean, he would, Isaac was praying, but it seems like, was it kind of preceding that prayer or part of it? He said, hey, we had a deal here. <laughs> I mean, he said you were going to give us, um, you know, progeny in the stars of the sun. So, how do we, what about me? 
I mean, that's kind of the yeah. The, bit yeah, of no, the, from that. Part, part of the prayer is exactly that. That God, this is this is actually living. You're living up. Yeah, to the, promise, yeah. You promised it. So yeah, that is that is something that we continue to do in our prayers. We'll we'll remind God or we'll say to God, especially like in a prayer like the Amidah, you made these promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, sometimes it's because of their merit. Sometimes we say, don't do it necessarily for us, do it for them, because we're their descendants, and give it to us because of our, our ancestry. But there is this other idea here too, which is that, but you promised us, you, you know, we're, we're reminding you of that promise. Um, Moses does it in the Bible. Moses does it in last week's Torah portion when God says after the golden calf incident, I'm going to destroy you. And Abraham and Moses says to, to God, you promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you promised our ancestors that you would bring us into the promise. You can't destroy us because you promised us. So making that a promise, making that a um, reminding God of the promise, making God aware of that promise is something that, um, you know, is something that we would, um, you know, we would say, hey, this is another part of our prayers. Our part of our prayers are saying to God, um, you know, you, you made us this promise. You have to, you have to, um, you know, you have to uh, fulfill it. So reminding God of that promise is, is an important issue. Thanks, Don. Anybody else, any comments on that? on that scene because this next text is 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 a little tough i'm going to tell you that right now it's a little tough why don't you read it the prayer yeah, the, the prayer brought a great miracle for isaac's physique was such that he could not have been expected to beget children and equally it was not the course of nature that rebecca should bear children am i reading that the way it sounds uh-huh uh, yeah, they have solutions for that today. What was he referring to? Um, we could take a guess. But. So, so what it what it's telling us is that both both Isaac and Rebecca physically shouldn't have been able to bear children. So the fact that they are able to bear children is actually a miracle. It's hmm. not what it's not what should have happened. So it's not. Um, it isn't. Um, this, this was a miracle. It wasn't the normal course that this, um, that they should have been able to have kids. Either Rebecca doesn't really say why, but uh, we can understand that she just was, she was infertile. That yeah. was just the way she was. The interesting thing about Isaac, you're talking about Isaac's physique, not being able to beget children. This is very strange because it says, we, we read earlier, right at the beginning here, that it says, Isaac was the counterpart of his father in body and soul. So the idea that there was something physically wrong with Isaac is not something that we would, would assume or, again, have in every version of the Midrash that Isaac physically couldn't bear children. But it's very interesting that we have this because this kind of goes along with this idea that, that Isaac physically does not recover from the, uh, the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, that the binding of Isaac actually rendered him physically, uh, phys I mean, literally physically damaged. And so this idea is not, is not, this is not the only place. It's not unique in the Midrash that there's something physically wrong with Isaac. Um, and again, it seems to go against this idea that he's, he's really physically mentally, spiritually is in great shape, like his father, Abraham, we also have this tradition that maybe he wasn't. And we don't really know, we don't really know anything about Isaac. So the fact that we can have these different traditions makes sense, because we don't know anything about him. We don't know whether, you know, he was strong or weak or what he looked like or what he did, really, because the Bible doesn't have anything about him. So the fact that we could have these different traditions about him <clears throat> is interesting. We also, so Mark, yeah. I'm sorry. Are we, so we're talking about his body from his circumcision then that he had later in life, right? No. Yeah. He, no, didn't, no. Have it. he didn't have it. Ishmael had it. Okay. So this, this, is, this, is, 
this is um, this is something interesting, and I will tell you that we do have um, we do have a, a, something that we could base this off of in the Torah. Let's just take a look back at the Torah, and that is we know that I that Isaac later on in life later on in life. Um, let's go a little bit ahead into into uh, chapter 27. It says, when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see, he called his older son Asan, said to him, my son, and he answered, he needy, right? The famous story of Jacob and Esau and the blessing. This is chapter 27. So it's only, it's only, a, it's only about a, half, a chapter and a half after the story we're reading right now. And notice that he says, and he said, I'm old and I do not know how soon I may die. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if we go off the fact that he's 60 when he has children and he seems to have, um, <clears throat> he's 60 when they're born. At this point, they seem to be roughly in their, let's say, 30s, 20s, 30s. When this incident happens, when we have this blessing scene, that means that Isaac would have been about 80 or 90 years old when this scene happens. Well, if, if that's the case, if he's 80 or 90 years old and he says to his son, Esau, I'm, I'm, I may die soon. I'm, I'm old. And we, the Torah specifically says his eyes are dim. Means he's, he's not physically in great shape. But does anybody remember how old Isaac is when he dies? He's the oldest living patriarch. So he lives older, he lives longer than his father, Abraham, slightly. And he lives even a little bit longer than his son, Jacob. Jacob lives to be 157. Abraham lives to be 175. Oh, gosh. Isaac lives to be 180. He's the oldest living patriarch. Wow. That's like a life and a half. I mean, a big life and a half, right? 120 is the most you can really live. That's Moses' life. He lives 60 years more than that. He lives 180 years according to the Bible. And the rabbis know that. And so here's the issue. When he does this scene, when the scene in 27 happens, he's 90 years old, but that would only put him at middle age. He, he's going to live a lot longer. So, so if he lives a lot longer, then something is going on with, with Isaac. Something's going on with him physically for a good chunk of his life. We could say at least half of his life. He's physically, it, well, he's at least thinking he's going to die. His eyes are dim. We know that. But beyond that, he's, we have this image of Isaac when he calls his sons, his son, Esau to do this, that he's, that he's almost like on his deathbed. Now, we don't know if he gets back up and feels better a couple of weeks later. Yeah. I, I don't think we want to assume that he's, you know, under quarantine. He's not, <laughs> he is actually, he's actually sick. That means that Isaac is not healthy, at least for half of his life, which wow. means the rabbis can, can extend that extrapolate to this that maybe Isaac is not a healthy person. Well, he had to have the dim vision or he wouldn't have been able to pull that. Right. And again, that's years later. I mean, we yeah. know that. I mean, and we take, we take the Torah, you know, at face value when it says that he's, his eyes are dim. Um, and that he, and at that moment, he definitely thinks that he's at the end of his life. And again, in reality, he's only probably halfway through his life at that point. So he doesn't have, I mean, Jacob at that point, hasn't even been married yet. He's going to get married in the next scene, but he's not even married yet. So he's a young man, Jacob and Esau are, are young men at that point. Dark, no matter what. He thinks he's not, he thinks he's not, I mean, at least he thinks he's not healthy and he's not, we know he's not completely healthy, but um, the rabbis actually go even further than that. When it says that his eyes are dim, that is oftentimes seen in the midrash as actually a, a euphemism for the fact that he is he's unable to to be physically 
able to procreate, to put it again in another euphemism. That his eyes being dim is actually means that his, you know, his, his fluids, his bodily levels, if you will, are not where they should be. Hmm. Does everybody get that? That's a really in interesting idea because the Bible later on, when we, we learn about Moses, right when we learn about his end of his life, it says that his eyes were, were, were strong, that his, he was still full of vigor, you know, that, that he is still essentially at 120, you know, physically fit in every way. So it seems like the almost the exact opposite with Isaac, which is why we have this midrash that he almost couldn't, I mean, not almost, he physically couldn't have kids, even as a 60 year old man. I mean, before that, from 40 to 60, he's also not physically uh, able to. And so the prayers of, his, of, of Rebecca and Isaac actually enable them to have children. And it's a miracle. It was not supposed to, physically, it was not supposed to happen. Now, again, the rabbis also probably feel uncomfortable putting all on Isaac, which is why they say Rebecca also was physically incapable of having children. All right. Everybody with us on that? I mean, it's, again, it's a very interesting midrash because it doesn't see, it's not the plain understanding of this, but the rabbis want to kind of come up with an answer for why can these, why are these people not able to have kids? Now, there's a very interesting midrash here on Rebecca and what we read in the Torah, as we've read, that she is in such pain while she's, while she's pregnant that she actually says, why am I pregnant? I would rather not be pregnant. Okay. And that's what the Torah says she says. Okay. When Rebecca. When Rebecca had been pregnant seven months, she began to wish that the curse of childlessness had not been removed from her. So that, 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 that's, wait right there. So that's basically saying she wished that she was still infertile. That's what it yeah. said. The Midrash yeah. said she wished that the curse of being childlessness hadn't been removed from her. That her yeah. prayers hadn't been answered. Because her wow. prayers had to be answered in order for her to have kids. Yeah. All right. She, she suffered tortuous pain because her two sons began their lifelong quarrels. In their <laughs> they strive to kill each other. If Rebecca walked in the vicinity of a temple erected to idols, Esau moved in her body. And if she passed the synagogue of that uh, Midrash, Jacob was say to break forth from her womb. The quarrels of the children turned upon such differences as these. Esau would insist that there was no life except the earthly life of material pleasures. And Jacob would reply, my brother, there are two worlds before us, this world and the world to come. In this world, men eat and drink and traffic and marry and bring up sons and daughters. But all this does not take place in the world to come. If it please you, do you take this world? And I'll take the other. Esau okay. has so hold, hold, it, hold, hold it right there. Let us, let's just take that into consideration for a second. Um, so again, Rebecca is having horrible pains. Um, and so she does, according to, according to the Bible, she act, she asked God why this is happening. Um, but why is it happening? The rabbis want to tell us in, in this very famous midrash that they were fighting in the womb and that they specifically would fight because Interutero, they knew when they were near a place of study, Jacob would want to come out. And when they were nearing a place of idols, Esau wanted to come out. So they were going to where they were instinctively wanted to be. Now, the interesting question, of course, here might be, well, we understand there's idols during the time of Jacob and Esau and, 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 uh, and isn't, by the way, Abraham is still alive at this period, if you do the math. Um, that there seems to be uh, there seems to be a a little bit of a problem that um, where's the bait midrash? Who's studying? Who's Don't studying, get that. Who would be studying in the bait midrash at that point? So um, it is interesting because um, 
the, the rabbis seem to assume that even by the time of Jacob, there were enough people studying that Jacob would, uh, would, would there'd be a bait midrash for Jacob to want to go study at. Um, so that's an interesting well, idea. Sad. What was that? Oh, somebody's on, not on mute again. Uh, so, but Mark, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Does this go back to the in utero that we studied a long time ago about learning Torah, but then when you were born, you forgot everything? Well, it definitely is part of that, Marcia, you're right. And it's also this idea that in utero, people know what babies, in, in fetus knows what's going on outside. And that uh, obviously these are miraculous children, but, um, but, but they understand. Um, um, they, they understand already that there's that there's uh, there's choices before us, and and mm. so even before they come into this world, they want to be in this world to some extent, and then we have this wonderful dialogue between Asa and Jacob, the twins inside in utero, where 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 Jacob literally says to his brother Esau who's is, who's basically a you know he's a he's a he's an epicurean or he's a he's a um, <laughs> following the philosophy of you know having fun in this world because there is nothing else and then Jacob says you're wrong brother you know there's there is uh, there's a short time we get in this world, but the world to come, uh, that's where that's where it really counts. And interestingly, Jacob says to his brother, "Listen, you can you can succeed in this world if you want to be the one that gets the most out of this world. I'll I'll give you that, and uh, and I'll take the world to come." Now, of course, this isn't a, a discussion between two brothers. This is a discussion between two philosophies of life. And essentially, it is a discussion that the rabbis are having between themselves and the Romans. And we're going to see this uh, in the Midrash, specifically with uh, a Jacob and Esau, that Jacob represents Judaism and Jewish tradition, the Jewish people. And Esau represents the Greco-Roman tradition, the Roman way of life. So by the time the rabbis are writing the Midrash, they have, they have a they have a head-to-head -head conflict with Greco-Roman, with Hellenistic, and 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 with the with the philosophies and the approaches of that world, they're dealing with 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 you know flat out kinds of uh, rejections of 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 there being any consequences with a kind of atheistic or 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 um, you know an, a world that that exists only in 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 uh, in what we can experience. And they're saying, and, and the rabbis are asserting, no, that this isn't even the main existence. The main existence is, is, is beyond, is in another existence. And so this is an argument, not just between two people, but between two complete ways of life. And so this is a huge, this is a huge issue that the rabbis use uh, Jacob and Esau to play this timeless story out. And it still exists today. I mean, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, it's, the issue isn't between uh, Jew and Gentile anymore, as it was during the time of the rabbis, but now it's between, you know, a, 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 a religious or a, or, a, or a belief in, 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 in the spirit as, as something that's real and is something that, that is, that is um, essentially more important than the, than the physical. This is this isn't a, simply a Jewish Gentile issue. Now, this is again between philosophies of 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 uh, almost religion, uh, all religion versus versus uh, an atheism. So, um, and a lack of belief in a in a world to come, which the rabbis um, believed was a necessity for for um, for every Jew. So this is this is an interesting discussion of. Again, philosophies approaches to the way we live our lives today. So um, let's read what happens with Esau. Esau had Samael. 
Um, Esau had uh, Samael as his ally who desired to slay Jacob in his mother's womb. But the archangel Michael hastened to Jacob's aid. He tried to burn Samael, and the Lord saw it was necessary to constitute a heavenly court for the purpose of arbitrating the case of Michael and Samael. Even the quarrel between the two brothers regarding the birthright at its beginning before they emerged from the womb of their mother, each desired to be the first to come into the world. It was only when Esau threatened to carry his point at the expense of his mother's life that Jacob gave way. So, oh, let's, pause, let's pause right here. So, um, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, you think? The first, let's do it with the first. So, <clears throat> The first is Esau um, had Samael as his ally, and then Michael being Jacob's ally. So what it's telling us here is that each one of those brothers had a different angel um, helping them. Now, why does Samael want to destroy Jacob? Because Samael is uh, the bad angel. <laughs> so Samael is another name for Satan. It's another name for uh, the angel of destruction. And um, either he's evil or he simply wants to be able to destroy humanity, which if Jacob is out of the way, he can destroy humanity. Michael, being the defender of, of the Jewish people, comes to our aid and stops this from happening. So, interestingly, um, this fight in the, in the womb actually becomes, according to the rabbis, something that even the angels were involved with. And it becomes a heavenly dispute. That's so nice. Which, again, reminds us that this fight between Jacob between the Jewish people and what, what Esau represents, which is, again, philosophies that Judaism is fighting against, whatever it is in whatever generation, um, we're, we're, number one, defended by Michael, but that w there, is, there are people that are trying to destroy us, stop and stop this message from, from uh, coming through. So, so from our standpoint, this is a, this is a, um, a battle through the generations that, um, that is, continues even to this day. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, idea that, that you get from, from, again, in, in the womb. Let's just now talk about this last part here, which is that Jacob and Esau were fighting to come out first, knowing that whoever come, came out first would be the recipient of the, the birthright, the inheritance, and also, again, essentially be the, the one in charge. So according to this, Jacob would have had at least a, a 50-50 shot, obviously, um, and that it was kind of like, who was going to be that one out? Who was going to be the first one out? So this is causing, <laughs> this is causing Rebecca a great deal of pain, and it would have killed her, according to the Midrash, and that Esau threatening to not stop until she dies and not really caring care whether he didn't care whether his mother carried her carried him and the brother he's willing to kill her that's where jacob backs away and says okay you can come out first i'm not gonna i'm not gonna risk my mom and more importantly maybe even my own life if we kill her then neither of us get born so jacob is willing to um stop fighting allow and allows esau essentially to come out first. So it shows again Jacob's 
the difference between the two of them. They saw as willing to even kill his mother in order to get out first. It's tough. It's a tough story. But again, I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna yeah. ask my twins how they feel about this. Yeah, whether it was that important to get out. For, well, in all fairness, because you are, uh, as you as you say, a twingle, right? Yep. It didn't really matter. Why is that? It didn't it didn't really matter whether Todd or Todd or Alex came out first. Oh, okay. Why? They don't get That's to. They're they're not the main inheritor, anyways. Oh, oh, got it, got it. Oh, that's funny, that's funny. But you know, it's it's interesting if you look at this stuff in terms of using your imagination and storytelling. Um, I can absolutely tell you that Todd dominated my whole body, and Alex was squished on the bottom. So, is there a parallel there? I mean, is it you know a meaning of something between these two, right? Well, well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you can see you can see that the more that the more violent one was the more violent one, according to the rabbis in utero. It wasn't just, it wasn't just when they emerged. And so, <laughs> yes, they do. They would say that the more, the more uh, physical one was the more physical one in the womb as That's well. So kind of makes sense. I guess you could say, yes, you are somebody who could testify to. to the <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating. Did you ever say why am I like this? Did you ever did you ever inquire of God, why am I pregnant if I have to suffer with this kind of pain? You know, and I wouldn't even call it pain, but I was terrified of the thought of two. I was terrified of carrying. I was terrified of all the what ifs. I mean, it really changes your reality when it's multiple. It really does. Well, I'm, I don't know. I well, and I was also carrying after back surgery, so you could talk about physical pain. <laughs> Well, there is definitely there's definitely appreciation for the fact that this is uh, this was difficult for this was difficult for Rebecca that um, after again she's she's dealing with the fact that she had been infertile for so long too for right. years, not being fertile that when she finally is able to have children that it's causing her such pain so this is this is the the the, the, the Bible says that. It says that she says, why is this happening? It, why does this have to, you know, is, you know, why am I, essentially, why am I, why am I alive? Why do I have to go through this? Yeah. So that's what it says that she says. And now um, there's an interesting midrash of what that actually meant, what, what that actually meant for her um, when she uh, goes around and talks to, to other people, seeing if this is normal. Okay, let's read this. Yeah. Rebecca, asked, uh, Rebecca asked other women whether they too had suffered such pain during their pregnancy. And when they told her they had not heard a case like hers except the pregnancy of Nimrod's mother, she betook herself to Mount Moriah, where Shem and Eber had their bet on Mishrash. She requested them, as well as Abraham, to inquire of God what was the cause of her dire suffering. Um, and Shem replied, My daughter, I confide a secret to you. Secret <laughs> that none finds it out. Two nations are in thy womb, and how should thy body contain them, seeing that the whole world will not be large enough for them to exist in the together peacefully? Two wow. nations they are, each owning a world of its own, the one the Torah, the other sin. <laughs> <laughs> From the one will spring Solomon, the builder of the temple, from the other Vespasian, the destroyer thereof. These two are what is needed to raise the number of million, uh, nations to 70. They will never be in the same estate. Esau will want lords, while Jacob will bring forth prophets. And if Esau has princes, Jacob will have kings. They, Israel and Rome, are the two nations destined to be hated by all the world. One will exceed the other in strength. First Esau so will subjugate the whole world, but in the end, Jacob will rule over all. The older of the two will serve the younger, provided this one is pure of heart, otherwise the younger will be enslaved by the older. Hmm. So let's pause right there. Hmm. This, this midrash of Rebecca, uh, um, Rebecca and um, um, 
what happens here is uh, very, very, I mean, we already talked about it a little bit, but it's very powerful. Because again, this is where we get Rebecca's children, this idea of, of, um, of the Rebecca, within Rebecca, are, are not just two ch two children, but two nations. And the, we're sorry about this. They're <laughs> coming contacting us through chat instead. What was that? Hello, thanks for calling Amazon. This call me. So, um, I will tell you that this is a really, really audacious midrash. It's an audacious midrash for this reason. The rabbis who were writing 2,000 years ago elevated themselves as the opposites of the Romans. Now, how does a nation of a few million that lives in Israel and in, in the far reaches of the Roman Empire at the time, how do they have the audacity to say, we are the other flip side of the Romans. There's the Romans and there's us. And in the end, it's really those two nations that make up the world. And um, interestingly, interestingly, um, they recognize the power of the Romans. They also recognize that people hate Israel and they also hate the Romans. So they, they, they hated the Romans but they also knew that the Egyptians hated the Romans, that the Syrians hated the Romans, that every place that was under Roman authority essentially hated the Romans. Hmm. But yet they understood that people hated them too. So interesting. Yeah. I just wondered to give me some perspective on time because I always forget the timelines and the Romans coming into this. Um, does this have anything to do with Masada? So when this would have been written, would have been, we know that this is after or around the time, but it had to have been after Masada or around that time. After? Because it, it, mentions, it mentions Vespasian. So it, and it says that Vespasian will destroy the temple. And they're talking about the second temple. They're talking about Vespasian destroying it in about 66, the common era. So 66 to 70 is that war that the Jews fought against the Romans. Wow. And the Romans destroyed the temple. So they said, look, one of Jacob's descendants is Solomon. He's going to build it. One of Isaac's descendants is, is one of Isaac's descendants. Okay. So or Rebecca's descendants, if you will, uh, is Solomon who's going to build a temple. And the, on the other hand, through Esau, Vespasian comes through the line of Esau. He's going to destroy the temple. So mm -hmm. interestingly, we have no, there's no genetic connection that we know of between the Edomites, Esau's descendants, Esau's people, and the Romans. But the Romans, the Jews saw the Romans as descendants of Esau. They saw them as, if not physical descendants, I mean, we, we don't have, uh, again, a genetic or geographical connection. But spiritually, they saw them as the inheritors of Esau. Why? because they're strong, they're powerful, they're violent, and they love this world. They love the pleasures of this world, which is what the rabbis will call sin. And then on the other hand, you have Jacob's descendants who will have Torah. Now, interestingly, you can make the argument that both of these got fused together by the, by the, by the Romans when they became Christian, that they fused together Esau's tradition and Jacob's tradition and brought both of them together. That was going to be my next question for you. So we have not established yet the, the, the Judaism, right? So there's still, if I'm, if I'm Mennonites or otherwise, or no, is no. one Jewish, one is not. So, so they're basically saying, the rabbis are saying here that that Esau's people are the Romans, or again, that they're, that they're spiritually descended, that they're the spiritual descendants of the Romans. So the Romans don't have, the Romans don't have the same values. They don't have the same concerns for Torah, for God, that the Jewish people do. They're great, they're mighty, 
but they're completely the other side of the coin. And literally think about it as the flip side of the same coin. That Jacob and Esau are twins that yeah. are the, the same coin, but they're flip sides. They can't, you, you can't have both of them up at the same time. Wow. If you flip them up, one of them's going to come up and one of them's going to come down. Wow. Both can't be up at the same time. That's totally. really important. But the wow. other thing is, is that they're, they're part of the same coin. That's the other part of this you have to take in, into consideration, that the rabbis had the audacity to put themselves on the same level of the Romans. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't for a second seem to consider that, well, here we are, we don't have an empire, but yet we're on the same level as the Romans. That we are, there's something about us that is, in a sense, more powerful than the Romans. And interesting again, as much as the as much as the Christian community, as much as the, the church inherited Judaism, they also inherited a tradition from the Romans. And um, and one can make the argument that the church the the the, the only reason why the Romans the Romans don't exist anymore, but any vestige of the Romans that does exist is there because of the Jews to some extent. I mean. The Romans, the, the legacy of the Romans, to some extent, is preserved within, within Christianity, within the church. So this is an interesting, I, I, I find this to be one of the most interesting midrashim in the, in the entire rabbinic text. Because this idea that the, that the Jews and the Romans are equals is amazing. It's an amazing idea that the rabbis would throw out 2,000 years ago, right after their temple is destroyed. Really, at, at the point of really, you can make the argument at their lowest point in existence that they would still say, "No, the Romans and us, th th we're we're flip sides of the same coin, and and as powerful as they are, we're that powerful too. It's just we can't be both powerful at the same time, and um, yeah, we can't we can't coexist. Both both of our powers can't exist at the same time. Hmm. So it's a really interesting." Midrash, uh, how it projects itself um, into it to to some extent into our um, um, into our own day. And there actually is a book written by a, um, a professor of Midrash uh, and of Jewish history called Rebecca's Sons. Rebecca's Sons, which is again an interesting idea to remember. That yes, this is Isaac's. These are Isaac's sons, but they're also Rebecca's sons, and and the rabbis don't ever seem to forget that Rebecca is really an important part of this of this story. That Rebecca is as much of a ancestor, as much of our ancestor as Isaac is, and that the and that her power and Isaac's power are part of what makes what makes these sons and their descendants so powerful is the two of them together and interestingly it is rebecca that that we're about to read that jacob is more connected to um again there is this understanding that the romans are also hated just like the jews are hated but for different reasons the jews seem to be hated because of their 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 idea of holding people accountable there's consequences that there's a sense of responsibility and the Romans are hated because they subjugate and they're, they're more powerful than everybody. So both of these things seem to be part of what makes the Jews and the Romans hated peoples, if you will. So an interesting, really interesting midrash. One of, one of the most important to understand how Judaism survived the destruction of the Romans and, and to some extent what still exists in our minds about why we are, the, why we are who we are how we're different from the rest of the world, if you will. The world of Esau, how it continues into our world is something that the rabbis will, will especially in the traditional world, will still, will still maintain. That, that, that Esau represents what Judaism, the other, side of, the other side of the coin. When we talk about understanding, studying Torah, on the other hand, the other stuff is, is Esau stuff. So another, I want to tell you, this is important because in the Orthodox world today, when we talk about how we dress or, or how we act, 
Jews can act like Esau. We're going to see that when we get to the story of, of Jacob putting on Esau's clothes. Jews can dress like Esau, but they have to be true to who they really are. They can't act like Esau. They shouldn't behave like Esau. And so in the Orthodox world, oftentimes when people, you know, are out there playing baseball or doing sports or in the world that's not Torah, they're in the world of Esau. They're, they're not in the world of Jacob. And so this is a really important issue that Jews can, Jews can easily move into that world because it, it, it's our twin. It's our, it's, it's our cousin. It's our, it's our brother. It's our part of who we are. It's really close. It's really so close. With, with that, um, the Jews and the Romans, does that create, and I don't know a lot about Catholicism, but so much of Catholicism mirrors symbolically Judaism. Is there some connection between that? Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. So, so, so Christianity, which is a fusion together of the, of the Greco-Roman world and the, and the Jewish world, you know, does to some extent try to, try to bring these things together. Um, you know, Judaism would, would hold that it, it, you can't, you, you can't, you can't, there, there are two sides of a coin. You can't have both sides. You can't see both sides. You, you've got to pick a side. And so for, for the rabbis, there's, there are two sides. You can, you can behave, you can pretend like you're that side, but you can't inhabit that side. You got to be on the other side of the coin. So, so it, is, it is very much a part of our mindset even to this day that you got to pick a side of which side you're on. You can't be both. So they, so they would essentially counter that any, any, you know, any, any kind of um, incorporation of the Roman side is not, is not what we're supposed to do. Not at, not at our core. We're not supposed to bring any of that into, into who we are. It's not supposed to be part of what we model, not the behavior we're supposed to model. We're supposed but isn't to, we're some of the symbolism behavior? But isn't right? some of the symbolism very similar? You know, the crown when they hold it over during um, the wedding and, yes. you know. Yes. So, so, so Judaism says that those types of, those types of, of uh, if you will, those types of concessions to the Roman, to the Roman side, to the Esau side, is not what we're supposed to do. That we shouldn't be on that side. Um, by the way, it doesn't mean that Jews don't have royalty. It says, on the contrary, Jews have kings and the Romans have princes. Our kings, like King David, uh, King Solomon, do represent Jewish power, but it's a different type of power. It's a different type of what is what is what is King Solomon build? He builds the temple. He doesn't build, you know. He doesn't build uh, amphitheaters. He doesn't build, he doesn't build uh, coliseums and forums. He doesn't build that. He builds a temple. So that's that's an interesting understanding of what Jews are supposed to do. So let us read about uh, their birth. Circumstances. The circumstances connected with the birth of her twin sons were as remarkable as the period of Rebecca's pregnancy. Esau was the first to see the light, and with him all impurity came from the womb. Jacob was born clean and sweet of body. Esau was brought forth with hair, beard, and teeth, both mountain, and he was blood red, a sign of his future sanguinary nature. On account of his ruddy appearance, he remained uncircumcised. Isaac, his father, feared that it was due to poor circulation of the blood, and he hesitated to perform the circumcision. He decided to wait until Esau should attain his 13th year, at the age at which Ishmael had received the sign of the covenant. But when Esau grew up, uh, he refused to give heed to his father's wish, and so he was left uncircumcised. The opposite, uh, the opposite of his brother in this is, as in all respects, Jacob was born with the sign of the covenant upon his body, a rare distinction. But Esau also bore a mark upon him at birth, the figure of a serpent, the symbol of all that is wicked and hated of God. Wow. So <laughs> let's, 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 uh, let's decompress that for a second. The fact of, of what they look like when they were born. Um, so Isaac, uh, 
Isaac um, looks at these kids when they're born and uh, um, there's a couple different things going on here in different midrashim. One is that Asok literally looks like a, like a monster when he comes out. Um, and we, it definitely says he's ruddy, which is why his name is Asok um, and Harry definitely gives us that. But the fact that he comes out with a beard and two sets of teeth, <laughs> that's fairly scary. Um, uh, this is a scary, uh, this would be a scary, uh, yes. And then he also has a serpent mark on him. Uh, this is fairly scary stuff. <laughs> By the way, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that Esau isn't, uh, isn't loved by his father. His father, on the contrary, seems to love him even more. So whatever he came out with, um, uh, whatever he came out, however he came out, it didn't, it didn't, it, it didn't make Isaac think that there was something wrong with him. Um, They're obviously not identical twins. No, no. <laughs> but uh, but I will tell you that. Um, uh, How do I say this? Esau is deaf. There's definitely some things going on with Esau when he's born that are not normal. And from that, the rabbis also tell us this interesting story that, again, is not in the Torah, that Esau is um, not circumcised, which would seem strange because Isaac, being the first person that circumcised at eight days old, would have been really, really eager to make sure that this new tradition came uh was part of um his family um well it doesn't seem like he does that because again the midrash telling us that he comes out messed up means that um means that there's a reason that he, he doesn't get circumcised at you know with within eight uh, on the eighth day in the normal within what i won't say normal because at this point, Isaac's the only one who had it. We know of who had an eight-day circumcision, but that, but that his own son doesn't do that. Um, and then, and so, so the interesting thing is, so Esau, according to the Midrash, doesn't have a circumcision. Uh, um, he was that that Isaac waits until he's thirteen, which was when Ishmael did it. So that's there's a there's a precedence for it. But then, because Esau is not a good person. He decides at 13 not to be, cir be circumcised okay. and won't let his father do it, which Ishmael, as we just read, did let his father do it. Um, but Isaac doesn't. So, um, what? Part of that then is also that whereas oh. Isaac needed. Yeah, you're, you're with us now, uh, Phyllis. Phyllis is there now. Hello. <laughs> that that if uh, if Esau, if yes if Esau wasn't circumcised on the contrary there's a midrash that Jacob didn't need to be circumcised because he was born circumcised which is again as the midrash tells us a rare distinction so that Jacob when he's born is so perfect he's so pure he's so good that he doesn't even need to be circumcised. So it's almost again that these two children come out almost exact opposites. Um, and what is the exact opposite of not getting circumcised ever? And that is being born circumcised. So that is, um, that's an interesting thing here. But it, it also kind of gives us this idea that, that um, Esau is physically, it's not that he's, it's not that he's, um, it's, it's going on now. He's physically, there's something physically wrong with him. Not that he's okay. strong, even, but that he's monstrous. That there's something physically, like, monstrous about him. But does that, can that be figurative for that he's born with um, a disease? He's born with illness. He's in the spectrum somewhere and not just, no, you know. Because that, that, that's not what they, the Bible simply says he's ruddy when he's born. He's hairy when he's born. Yeah, but, but that's not, figurative, maybe. But, but, but so that's what the Torah says. The rabbis use that as a as a way to launch off to the fact that 
this wasn't just a matter of strength, just a matter of, of being physically, maybe even attractive, that he's actually monstrous, that his, that, his, that his body is a reflection of his personality, which is not, again, it's not a, it's not necessarily something that we'd like to, like to be left with that, that people look, are born a certain way, they look a certain way when they're born, and then they, they're, they're doomed to be that way. Correct. We, we actually like to, we like stories where that's the opposite, where the <laughs> person that looks monstrous is actually, you know, it's a Quasimodo kind of situation where, no, the guy is really, really a good person um, or wants to be a good person. This is not, this is not what the rabbis give us. The rabbis give us the, the story that he's a bad, he's a, he's a, he's, he's physically, um, he's, he's physically monstrous. Yeah. So this is, um, this is again, not necessarily a happy story, but, but the, the Bible doesn't give us happy stories. And so the Midrash oftentimes makes the stories even scarier than the Bible does. They, they, it makes them sometimes happier than, than the, the endings are sometimes uh, even more positive and more uplifting or, or we get extras, but also it goes the other direction, which is that we sometimes get extra scary. And that's what we just got. We got extra scary with Esau and uh, an extra um, dangerous, if you will. So let's read this, uh, this final paragraph here. The names. The names conferred upon the brothers are pregnant with meaning. The older was called Esau because he was a Sui. Am I pronouncing A Sui yeah. fully, fully developed when he was born. And the name of the younger given to him by God to point to some important events in the future of Israel by the numerical value of each letter. The first letter in Yaakov, Yod, with the value of 10, stands for the Decalogue. The second, Ayan, equal to 70, for the 70 elders, leaders of Israel, the third, a 100, for the temple, 100 L's in height, and the last bet for the two tables of stone. Yep. So let's explain what just happened. There's a play, a midrash, on their names. So it says that Esau is actually a play on the Hebrew word Asui, which is interesting because the Bible tells us why he's called Esau. It actually says why he's Esau. And let's, uh, let's go back to the Torah. We've read before haven't we oh yeah yeah we've read it and we'll take a, a quick look at it it says they saw the first one emerged red like a hairy mantle all over so they named him Esau uh, then his brother emerged holding on to the heel of Esau so they named him Yaakov um, that, that's what the Bible says um, that's what the Bible says that they are um, why they're called what they are and um, and so um, the, the Bible is telling us, if you look here, that, that he's called Esau because there's Se'er, because there's hair, there's hair all over him. And then Yaakov is called Yaakov because he grasps the heel, Ahuzat Ba'akev, that he takes, the, he takes the heel of his brother. So... Um, these are the reasons that the names are given in the Bible. The Midrash isn't really, I would say, happy with that. And you can understand why. You can understand why it's not happy. Because those aren't really, those don't really go along with the, those don't go along with this idea that the names are necessarily really good and bad. Uh, a hairy mantle just isn't means he's hairy. Uh, <laughs> grabbing on a heel could even mean he's a heel. Which, which even in the biblical period, the midrashic period, calling somebody heel is not a good thing. It's, it's your heel, kind of the same way we use it in English. So here they actually make a play on Yaakov that the letters themselves stand for something, and that each letter stands for something great. So the yud is obvious as ten is the ten commandments. 
Uh, ayin is a little bit uh, harder to see. Ayin is the numerical value when we do the letters equaling numbers, gematria, like chai, right? Chai is 18. Ayin, one letter, is the, is the number 70, which according to our tradition, there are 70 elders that help lead the people. And um, 70 is a, a numerically uh, good number. It's seven number, a complete number, times 10, another complete number. Uh, the third kof, the, the uh, kuf, is maybe a little harder. That's 100. That's 100. Now, you'd think 100 is an easy number to get some, some, um, uh, some symbolism from. Well, it's not necessarily. There's not a lot of hundreds uh, in the Bible, but there is one really interesting one that the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, is 100 L's in height. So it's, it's tall. I mean, it's very tall. It's like three, you know, four, sto five stories. So it's a lot. Um, uh, and then the last is Bet for two, which are the two tablets that the Ten Commandments were on. The two tablets. So that's what two stands for. So each of those numbers has a really, really important kind of midrashic understanding. Um, so that is a play on Jacob's name that's a little bit more positive. We're going to finish with this last section today, and then we will, um, we actually read a lot more. Uh, we didn't have as much dialogue or much discussion, but that's okay. Um, but um, we did have, uh, we did have some good, uh, we had some very good lessons today. We had some good inspiring text about who we are and being the children of Jacob. But uh, let's read this last section here. Of Abraham. Of Abraham. This is wow. a little bit about, about him. While well, Esau and Jacob were little, their characters could not be judged properly. They were like the myrtle and the thorn bush, which learned to like in the early stages of their growth. But after they attained full size, the myrtle, known by its fragrance, and the thorn bush by its thorn. In their childhood, both brothers went to school, but when they reached their 13th year and were of age, their ways parted. Jacob continued his studies in the Bet Ma Midrash of Shem and Eber, and Esau abandoned himself to idolatry in a immoral life. Both were hunters of men. Esau tried to capture them in order to turn them away from God, and Jacob did turn them toward God. In spite of his impious deeds, Esau possessed the art of winning his father's love. His hypocritical conduct made Isaac believe that the firstborn son was extremely biased. Father, he would ask Isaac, what is the tithe on straw and salt? The question may appear God-fearing in the eyes of his father, because these two products are the very ones that are exempt from tithing. Isaac failed to notice, too, that his older son gave him forbidden food to eat, what he took for the flesh of young goats and his dogs. Rebecca was more clear. No, 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 hold, hold, hold. Let, no. Let's stop right there. Let's okay. stop. Before we move on, uh, um, that's pretty wild. Um, so it says that um, they're not just, uh, it says, first of all, that Jacob studied. He studies in Beta Midrash. Which one? The Beta Midrash of his ancestor, Shem and Eber. The same ones who were the, son and grandson of Noah. So if you do the math, they're both still alive. And according to the Midrash, we've seen it a few times, they are, um, they are uh, righteous people. They're people who don't have, um, they, they have a, um, they have a, uh, a, a responsibility to, um, to teach the generations that come after them, uh, Torah. So it's interesting that, that um, according to the Midrash, if you again do the math, they were alive into Jacob's time. And so Jacob got to, to learn from them. Um, it says that Esau, on the other hand, didn't want to go to school. He didn't, he didn't uh, make the most of this, these opportunities. 
And so what happens? Uh, he goes and starts living in, in, in a moral life. It tells us that Esau is a hunter. The, the, the Midrash tells us that Esau would try to get people to not be pious, whereas Jacob did the exact opposite. Now, doing all these kinds of things, which again, we don't know much of about, about them, other than it seems that, again, one of them was good and one of them was bad, um, or one of them was, was uh, not even necessarily good and bad, that Jacob was, was a person who lived in the tents and Esau was out hunting. The Midrash goes much further than that. And it also has to explain why was Isaac, why did Isaac like, why did Isaac like uh, Esau? Okay. Why, did he, why did he, why did he feel, have any good feeling towards him at all? And so the Midrash gives us this understanding that um, it's because Esau uh, pretended that he was a good actor. that he would ask his dad questions just to get his dad to like him. But that in reality, he was just doing it as a joke. He was teasing his dad. He'd ask him questions about things that, that really didn't have an answer. Does everybody get that? And even worse, that when his dad thought he was getting him food kosher food he switched it out and didn't give his dad kosher food wait don't go anywhere everybody i gotta do one thing <laughs> I just took the, oh, he, he lost the rabbi yeah. <laughs> who's sitting in the room that's my canary oh, yeah. you know, start. i need to charge because i'm about to die yeah <laughs> I thought you had to go potty. No. <laughs> That's what we thought. <laughs> no. Just kidding. No, not, not I would, not I would extend, not go be away for one second. Um, <laughs> literally. All right, I made it. So we're charged. We're almost done. I didn't want to, didn't want to die in the last minute. So, um, yeah. Th so this story is is horrible because he actually gives his father dog meat. That is uh, pretty much the lowest thing you can do when you're trying to take care of your father and your father thinks you're taking good care of him and doing the right thing and he's doing the exact opposite. So again, the Bible doesn't seem to give us any reason to believe that Aesop treated his father badly, but the, the Midrash does. The Midrash doesn't want to even say that Isaac... Um, that, you know, Isaac was being fooled. Now, if that's the case, let's read what Rebecca did. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, Rebecca. She knew her sons as they really were. <laughs> and therefore, her love for Jacob was exceedingly great. The oftener she heard his voice, the deeper grew her affection for him. Abraham agreed with her. He also loved his grandson Jacob. For he knew that in, his, in him his name and seed would be called. And he said upon Rebekah, My daughter, watch over my son Jacob, for he shall be in my stead on the earth and a blessing in the midst of the children of men, and for the glory of the whole seed of Shem. Having admonished Rebekah thus to keep guard over Jacob, who is destined to be the bearer of the blessing given to Abraham by God, he called for his grandson, and in the presence of Rebekah, he blessed him and said, Jacob, my beloved son, whom the soul loveth, may God bless you from above the firmament. And may he give you all the blessings wherewith he blessed Adam and Enoch and Noah and Shem and all the things which he told me and all the things which he promised to give me may he cause to cleave to you and to thy seed forever. According to the days of the heavens above the earth and the spirit of Mastima shall not rule over you or your seed to turn you from the Lord who is thy God for henceforth and forever. And may the Lord God be a father to you, and mayest you be his firstborn son, and may he be a father to thy people always. Go in peace, my son. 
So, so what did we read? And again, we're going to finish up with this. This will be our last paragraph, our last paragraph or so. Um, this tells us that uh, a couple things. First of all, Rebecca, Thank very you. good. Is very good. Um, Rebecca is the one who knows what's really going on. Isaac can't see it. Maybe again, his eyes being dimmed. He can't see it physically or spiritually or doesn't want to see it. But Rebecca is, on the other hand, clear sighted. And she knew what was really going on. And so um, she, uh, she's the hero of the story. That's in the Bible. We never get un any understanding of whether Abraham knew his grandsons. And so we do have this midrash here where not only does he have a relationship with his grandsons, he also has this relationship to Rebecca um, and says specifically to him, look, I don't, you know, essentially, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here for, but take good care of Jacob. He's going to be the one, um, he's going to be the one that will protect my legacy, that'll protect humanity. And so this is the, um, this is the legacy that, 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 that Jacob has. And what's interesting about this Midrash is that, again, it seems to completely skip over Isaac. It reinforces this idea that Isaac is, is literally an afterthought, is in the background, is not part of the, other than passing, other than being the father, the link, he doesn't do anything else. That it's Rebecca and Abraham together that makes sure that Jacob does what he needs to do. So this connection between the grandson and the, and the son exists and passes right over Isaac. And so you can see that these blessings that, that these patriarchs before them had, Adam and Enoch, Enoch Hanoch, and Noah, that the, and Shem, that these were righteous people and that Jacob is going to be following in that tradition, that he's going to be a righteous human being. Now, when it says the spirit of Mastema shall not rule over you, this is an interesting, another allusion to an angel that according to the, um, again, during the rabbinic period, uh, doesn't come up a lot in the Bible, but does come up in, the, in, the, in other Jewish sources like pseudepigrapha and kinds of um, extra biblical, extra um, rabbinic, extra biblical sources. This Mastema is, a, is another angel of death angel of destruction, um, something that you don't want to be around. And so uh, Mastema is some kind of bad angel, scary angel, devil, if you will, maybe even, and you don't want to have him around. And so this will not be part of, of Jacob's, uh, you know, that Jacob's descendants should have no connection to this. It should never have to worry about it. And, and it, should, it should not be part of your life. So let's finish up with this last paragraph. It's almost right on time. Abraham. Abraham. And Abraham had good reason to be particularly fond of Jacob, for it was due to the merits of his grandson that he had been rescued from the fiery furnace. Which is a midrash that we read months ago, that mm -hmm. Abraham is placed in the fiery furnace uh, and goes through these trials, and that doesn't seem to be because of Isaac, but because of Jacob. So let's read this last paragraph. Isaac and Rebekah, knowing of Abraham's love for their young son, sent their father a meal by Jacob on the last feast of the Pentecost, which Abraham was permitted to celebrate on earth, that he might eat and bless the creator of all things before he died. Abraham knew that his end was approaching, and he thanked the Lord for all the good he had granted him during the days of his life and blessed Jacob and bade him walk in the ways of the Lord. And especially he was not to marry a daughter of the Canaanites. Then Abraham. Oh, so, yeah. We read about Abraham's death last week. We opened with it and now we're kind of finishing with it again. So what does Abraham do before he dies too? He tells his grandson, don't marry a Gentile. Don't marry a Shiksa. That was his, his parting, his parting words to his, to his, to his grandson. Um, Pretty amazing. So uh, not, a, not, not a whole lot has changed.
in thousands of years of Jewish history, that's what the grandfather said to his grandson as a, as a child, right, by the way. He might have been a little, he might have been a five, six, seven year old child at this time. All right, here's what it says. Uh, then Abraham prepared for death. He placed two of Jacob's fingers upon his eyes, and thus holding them close, he fell into his eternal sleep while Jacob lay beside him on the bed. The lad did not know of his grandfather's death until he called him on awakening next morning. Father, father, and received no answer. That's interesting. Wow. So what's so powerful about that final line? I mean, let's final, you know, that Jacob was there when his grandfather died. He was there at his deathbed with his, with his grandfather, Abraham. That's a very powerful scene. It's a powerful scene because it shows us the power that um, grandparents have with their child. And um, yeah, that's true. Isaac isn't there, but Jacob is. Isn't this reflective of um, the part where um, Abraham views death before he dies? Yeah. So now he's laying there and he's comfortable with death and having Jacob by his side. It, def it definitely seems to be a different midrash. It definitely seems to be a different tradition that, that has that Jacob was there when he died. Um, it, is a, it is a interesting midrash because it basically says that Jacob, Jacob is, is a witness to it. And that he actually repeats the same words that his father had said, avi avi, when they were about to, um, when he when Isaac was about to be sacrificed, that he says to his grandfather, uh, avi avi, and then there's no answer. So that's a really powerful midrash because the same words that that were said in this critical moment of the sacrifice of Akedah are now repeated by the grandson. And now there is no answer. So it's a, it's a very dramatic, very, very powerfully written midrash. But it also is a beautiful midrash that Abraham knew that his legacy was now going to be um, continued by his grandson. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a saying that we know that our children will, you know, we know what's going to happen with our children because they're our children. But you know, when our grandchildren continue in our ways, then that's something very special to know that our grandchildren are um, continuing our legacy and continuing our tradition, continuing, you know, our values. That's a really important idea in Judaism. And it's here in, in, it's here in the text that um, the scene be between Abraham and his grandson tells us that Abraham dies knowing that his grandson is, gonna, is going to um, do the right thing pretty powerful so um um it says that abraham was by the way according to this midrash that he gets to live to see uh shavuot the feast of pentecost so um that he died around that time and uh and that he got to have jacob with him so um that's our first virtual class. Was our... Wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Now, the rest of the day, just so you know, tomorrow night we have our class at seven. I know that's going to be a little late for the Schwartzes. Uh, <laughs> but, Not for us. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we may, we may chime in. But we want, get, we want to get as many of you, uh, the Missouri Schwartzes, yes. Uh, that's my bedtime. <laughs> we, um, but we hopefully will have um, you all there. We had, uh, we ended up having a minion for most of the time. We had a few people that came and went. I, I hope we get, uh, again, um, maybe people who haven't studied, but it was great doing this today. I will tell you what's going to happen the rest of the day for me. I'm working on, um, the Friday night service, uh, for Friday nights. So we're going to have that ready to stream, uh, and ready for, for doing Friday night. We may even have a, uh, an East Coast version ready so that so that uh, the Schwartzes don't have to wait until eleven o'clock to the East Coast Schwartz or the or whatever the Midwest the, Schwartzes? the Ozark the Ozark Schwartz that they, uh, the, the, they can watch uh, at, a, at a decent time. But that's what I'm going to be doing for the rest of the day today is working on that, trying to get something good up for for that. Um, but hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night.
and then again on um, on Friday night, Friday evening. So definitely have it up for eight o'clock Friday, but maybe even earlier too. So yeah. have a good rest of the week, everybody. Stay healthy. And um, hey, Mark, I have a question yeah. for you. Will yeah. we get a different uh, number to log into each time, or do we yeah. always use the same number we had today? Same login for Tuesdays, the same login for Wednesdays. Okay, so we just and the same for Friday. Okay. Yep. And Make remind sure. people and remind people that they can connect even by phone. So you don't have to have a, a computer or tablet. You can even connect by phone with Zoom. So you know this is a this is a, I want to thank Don for getting this started for us a couple of weeks ago. Yay! He's a prophet. Thank you, Don. He knew that we were going to have to. He knew that we were going to have to do this. So he, maybe he's maybe he's responsible for this. Wait a second. I just realized. It's another conspiracy theory. Hogan is responsible. So uh, again, everybody stay healthy and join us tomorrow night. And uh, and um, you know this is our way of keeping our community strong during this time. So yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank everybody, you. Everybody, Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.